Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, ever merciful. Assalamu alaikum. Peace and blessings of Allah be upon you, dear viewers. Welcome to tonight's live online lecture organized by the UK Talim Department. As per our tradition, we will start with the recitation of the Holy Quran. If I could please request Muhammad Mubarak Sahib to recite the portion. Sakratullah. <coughs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ورسلا قد قصصناهم عليك من قبل من قبل ورسلا لم نقصصهم عليك وكلم الله موسى تكليما رسلا مبشرين ومنذرين ليلا يكون للناس على الله حجة بعد الرسل وكان الله عزيزا حكيما لكن الله يشهد بما أنزل إليك بما أنزل إليك أنزله بعلمه والملائكة يشهدون وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَهِيدًا The translation of the verses recited are from Surah Nisa, verses 165 to 167. The translation is as follows. I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the accursed. In the name of Allah, the gracious, ever merciful. And we sent some messengers whom we have already mentioned to thee, and some messengers whom we have not mentioned to thee. And Allah spoke to Moses particularly, messengers, bearers of glad tidings, and warners, so that people may have no plea against Allah after the coming of the messengers. And Allah is mighty, wise. But Allah, wears, but Allah bears witness by means of the revelation which he has sent down to thee that he has sent it down pregnant with his knowledge. And the angels also bear witness, and sufficient is Allah as a witness. Jazakallah. Jazakallah. Asl jaza. Uh, tonight we have the pleasure of being joined by Sayyid Adil Shah Sahib, who serves as Murabi al-Silsila and works in the Marka's press and media office under Abid Khan Sahib. As viewers are aware, the Dalim lectures cover a range of important educational topics, including refuting false allegations against the Ahmadiyya Muslim community and claims that the prophecies of the promised Messiah were not fulfilled. This evening is no exception, as Murabi Sahib will speak on the topic of the prophecy about Muhammad, Muhammad Begum. As always, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions. These will be put to Murabi Sahib on your behalf in the last 15 minutes. Please type your questions into the live chat and kindly ensure that they are relevant to tonight's topic. It gives me pleasure to hand over to Murabi Sahib to deliver tonight's lecture. Jazakallah, Bakar Sahib. Uzbillahi minash shaitan rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Before I begin my lecture, on the topic of Muhammad Begum, I'd like to say that the Talim Department is doing a wonderful effort in providing the Jamaat, the UK Jamaat, with um, lectures by dignitaries of the Jamaat, 
ex excluding me, not including me. For example, having Tahir Majid Sahib, um, Major, Major Mahmood Sahib, um, and all the contemporary lectures that are being delivered. Um, as Vakar Sahib mentioned, that the topic that I will be speaking about is on Ahmed Beg and Muhammad Begum. So the Promised Messiah received a revelation concerning Ahmed Beg and Muhammad Begum. And it doesn't matter if you don't know or if we don't know too much about it, inshallah, by the end of this lecture, our aim is to have an insight uh, or to be provided with an insight um, of who MD, um, Ahmed Beg was, who Muhammad Begum was, and, and why this particular prophecy was made. Um, and so I've got a, a slide a show or PowerPoint prepared as well, and inshallah, we'll be referring to it from time to time. So the question is that we want to know is, or why is that, why was this prophecy made? So who was Muhammad Begum? And why did she fall under this prophecy? What was the need for her to have or, or, or to be included in this particular prophecy. And before I start, I just wanted to ask um, uh, Vakar Sab, is my uh, PowerPoint uh, viewable? Can it be seen? Yes, yes, Murabi Sab. Okay, take it. So the, the, the question we're going to be asking or speaking about is, why was this prophecy made? Who is Muhammad Begum? What was her connection with this prophecy? Why did she come under the Promised Messiah, alayhi salatu wasalam's prophecy? Um, but to understand this, we need to also understand that the reason why we're discussing this, this particular prophecy and prophecies in general, is that whenever prophets of God, and the Quran is laden with these verses, it mentions that whenever prophets of God come to the world, they are ridiculed, they're called magicians, they're called liars. And prophecies that they make are often seen as a, as a gesture and they, they're made into uh, mockery. So Mulvi Sanallah, when this particular prophecy was made, he often ridiculed this sign and he harbored uh, demented notions in relation to this prophecy. He, he wrote a pamphlet called Nikai Mirza, filled with muddled perceptions that he claimed contradicted the prophecy. And for this reason, not just as a response, but also for the benefit of the Jamaat, of those righteous souls who are keen to know the detail of the prophecy, it is important that this, this matter is scrutinized and studied in detail. And I will come to who Muhammad Begum was, why this particular prophecy was made and the outcomes of this prophecy. But before we come to uh, understanding this particular prophecy, we need to understand that, uh, that there are two types of prophecies, Inzari and Tabshir. And the Holy Quran refers to this as well, where it says in Surah Nisa, verse 166, that Rusulan Mubashirina wa Munzirin, that messengers who are bearers of glad tidings and warners. So Allah Ta'ala is mentioning the two types of um, prophets. So they are either the, they're bearers of glad tidings or they are warners. And explains that Allah the Almighty has revealed signs do not always concern, concern glad tidings. They're not always tabshiri. Tabshiri means glad tidings. So Allah Ta'ala's revealed signs aren't always tabshiri. They're not always glad tidings. But rather for the opponents of his prophets may contain warnings, which warnings meaning anxiety pesh kunya. So there's two types of prophecies. One is tabshiri, which, is, which concerns or which inculcates glad tidings. And the second is uh, anxiety. So uh, a sense of warning that is uh, mentioned in them. But there is a, a slight issue. Those individuals who are oblivious to God's uh, system of the manifestation of inzari signs, of warnings, interpret inzari or warning signs the same as they interpret the pshiri signs. And such misinterpretations result in individuals mischaracterizing uh, such signs and thereby alleging that signs were predicted by Allah Ta'ala to prophets but apparently were not fulfilled. The prophecy that was shown to the promised Messiah in relation to Mirza Ahmed Beg and his close relatives was in fact also an anxiety sign, so a warning sign shown by Allah the Almighty to prove the truthfulness of the promised Messiah. Now, coming to the purpose of this prophecy, why was this particular prophecy made? 
who was Mohammed Begum, who was Ahmed Begum, why did they have such a role to play in the history of the Jamaat? Then one thing we should understand is that in order to in order to understand the importance and truthfulness of this prophecy, certain questions are asked. These first the the first of these questions is that why was this prophecy made? Why was the promise of Sayyid Islam, according to the opposition of the Jamaat, the, and the, those who speak against the Jamaat, why did the promise of Sayyid Islam entertain this thought, Nauz Billah? And why did God Almighty command the, uh, the promise of Sayyid Islam to complete a nikah with Ahmed Beg's daughter, Muhammad Begum, thus establishing a relationship with each other? And if if an indiv individual believes that, so the prophecy really briefly, and I'll come into it in detail uh, in a bit, the prophecy was that the Prophet Islam was told to complete a nikah with Muhammad Begum, who was the daughter of Ahmed Beg. Now, the question which naturally arises is that did the Prophet Islam desire social status? Was marrying Muhammad Begum was the reason behind it that the Prophet Islam wanted some sort of status? Now, if, if if any individual was to believe that the Promised Messiah, alayhi salam, desired to elevate his reputation and social state, uh, status through such a union, then this minute thought holds little meaning. As the increase of family status occurs on the terms of righteousness, purity, being from a well-known family background, worldly status, respect, and wealth. Mirza Ahmed Beg's family, Ahmed Beg's family had nothing of this sort that would have compared to the family of the Promised Messiah Islam. And the caliber of righteousness which the family of the Promised Messiah Islam held is no hidden matter either. Even in terms of family grandeur, Ahmed Beg had no power or status which would have piqued the interest of the Promised Messiah Islam in regards to this particular marriage. Even when considering worldly status, something which the family of the Promised Messiah held many generations. We read in books of history how his grandfathers um, had land and many other things under their names, even in terms of, of, of worldly status. It's a matter that can't be challenged. Mirza Ahmed Bair, Ahmed Bair, neither him nor his family um, had the same worldly status no, no, in terms of status, no, in terms of wealth, as the Promised Messiah Islam did, and in, in, in other words, in, in, in summary, the Promised Messiah Islam stood distinct and elevated from others, and therefore, it is evident that none of these matters were reasons as to as to a means of inciting one for marriage. And if a person has become void of spiritual light, if a uh, Opponents claim that um, the Promised Messiah Islam married Muhammad Begum because he knows Billah, it was a lustful desire, or knows Billah, he wanted worldly status. If a person has become void of spiritual insight and is of an impious nature, then for such a person exists no cure, such as the state of a blind and the same, uh, the state of such a person is exactly the same as that blind and ill minded per pe person or people whom had accused the Holy Prophet وسلم, of falling in love with Hazrat Zainab You remember, you might recall, or you'd know that Hazrat Zaid was married to Hazrat Zainab before. And they had a divorce and the promise, uh, Holy Prophet وسلم, married her. Uh, the same people who accused the Promised Messiah Islam of Nazbillah lustful inclinations accuse the Holy Prophet وسلم, of marrying Hazrat Zainab because he liked how she looked. Prophet Joseph وسلم, or Prophet Hazrat Yusuf وسلم, was falsely accused of wanting to seduce Potiphar's wife. Prophet David وسلم, Hazrat Dawud وسلم, was falsely accused of, of forcefully keeping a man's wife in his house only because he felt attracted to the occupant's wife. It is, it's also falsely narrated that Hazrat uh, 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 Suleiman salam, fell in love with a woman and completed the uh, religious bonds with her afterwards. Yet, those who possess knowledge and wisdom will come to accept the fact that all these notions are false and will retain a sense of resentment against such people who are falsely accused by his people through the ill thoughts without feeling any remorse. 
So the Prophet has said again and again that who among you can raise a finger on my life? And the Quran says that when prophets come after they claim prophethood, they say, this is in Surah Yunus, that they proclaim that فَقَدْ لَبِسْتُ فِيكُمْ أُمَرًا مِنْ قَبْلِيَ فَلَا تَعْكِلُمْ That I have spent a whole lifetime amongst you before claiming prophethood. You would unanimously agree that I've spoken the truth, nothing but the truth. I have uh, shown that I am a noble uh, person and uh, of noble character. Then when I'm making these prophecies or when I'm mentioning that I am a prophet, why do you turn away? And the Prophet Muhammad's state of heart regarding this particular prophecy was that his condition was such that on, on the 20th of June in 1886, he wrote a letter to Hazrat Khalifatul Masih Awwal, later to become Hazrat Khalifatul Masih Awwal, Hazrat Mulana Nuruddin Azillah Ta'ala And he said that, he said that the situation of this humble one is such that there has been a divine sign hindering to this third nikah. And the Prophet Messiah is not right that my situation has turned into a, such a state of worry and has become apprehensive. But there is no chance of rejecting the divine command. And he, uh, he goes further on to say that nonetheless, the state I am in is an unpleasant one. This humble one, the Prophet Messiah is not mentioning that this humble one has decided that so long as God Almighty does not show a clear and vivid sign, the Prophet Messiah said that he will keep himself estranged. To this matter, and this is also recorded in Al Hakam on 17th of June 1903. Now, um, I, we asked this question in the beginning what, why? Why Ahmed Beg? Why his daughter Mohammed Begum? Why did they become enraged or, or engulfed in this particular prophecy? Now, the conditions of the relatives of the Promised Messiah, meaning Ahmed Beg and Mohammed Begum, was that the close relatives of the Prophet Muhammad and that is Muhammad Begum's uncle, aunt, paternal aunt, and mother, they were all faithless and they were trapped deeply in atheism. So much so that they would hurl abusive words directed to the Holy Prophet They would mock Islam and they would find joy in their mockery. So much so that they didn't just stop at that, they went on to denounce the existence of Allah Ta'ala. They were incredibly influenced by Hindu customs. Hence, they were of the belief that Islam mistakenly allowed the process of the nikah to be carried out with one's paternal uncle or maternal aunt's daughter, so in cousin marriages. They claimed very boldly that bringing any of the cousins into one's nikah is equal to marrying one's own blood-related sister. Nauz billah. And when they were told about the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi marriage to his aunt's daughter, Zainab Ta'ala they would claim that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, knows Billah, had made a mistake. So this was the condition of the close family relatives of the Promised Messiah namely Ahmed Deir and his family. And then what happened was that they didn't just, they didn't just um, rely on that. They then implored a sign from the Promised Messiah They didn't just stop at, say, denouncing the Qur'an, the existence of Allah Ta'ala, uh, hurling abuse towards the Holy Prophet They went a step further. They came to the Promised Messiah and said that, we want a sign. But the thing is, when Allah Ta'ala appointed the Promised Messiah to his appointed office for the reformation of those who possess knowledge, it had minor effect on them. They they multiplied in disbelief and enmity to such a level that they employed a sign to be shown which would prove that Islam is truthful and this world has a creator. They and the, the family of the Prophet Society Islam didn't just rest at their abuses. They pub, pub, uh, they published a pamphlet in Jashme Noor, so a newspaper which used to be published from Amritsar in August 1885 in which abusive language was used for the Holy Prophet and the Holy Quran. They denied the existence of God. And in that, they demanded a sign regarding the truthfulness of the Prophet Muhammad and for the existence of God. And they cascaded this pamphlet to every area possible. And now, naturally, the question arises that what was Hazur's response? What was the response of the Promised Messiah, Ali Salatu Salam? 
the answer to this is that when the when the inequity and behavior progress so much so that their disbelief and immorality had take uh, developed or developed um, or had taken rather we should say had taken developed roots in their minds which made them present foul words to the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and devalue the holy quran and reject the existence of the divine as a way of habit so they didn't just do it once or twice they made it a habit but then the promised messiah alayhi salam humbled himself before the divine and he pleaded to allah taala rabbul the rabbul alamin to the lord of all the world that he should so uh, show a sign to these disbelievers from himself and then naturally what happened when the most beloved of allah taala calls allah taala to his help allah taala responded and he said and this is um this is a, a, a translation of allah taala's word he said i saw their negation and transgress surely i will inflict upon them in various ways and will leave them no room for salvation in this world you will see how i act with them and we are mighty over all things allah taala said this is the uh, words of the uh, revelation he said that i will make their wives widows their children orphans orphans and will make their houses as if they have been abandoned so that they taste what their doing led them to allah taala further goes on to say that i will annihilate the, uh, annihilate them in one go Uh, he said, "Sorry, Allah Taala said that I will not annihilate them in one go. Rather, their wrath will descend, descend steadily, so that they may revert and become of those who submit to Allah." And Allah Taala then further on goes to say that my curse will be inflicted uh, uh, upon them and upon their houses, their juniors, their seniors, their men, and their guests, and whoever subsides with them, because all of them are a curse. And he said that whoever the distinction will be, though, whoever believes. and does good deeds and separates their ties with this particular family from Ahmed Beg and his family and rejects to sit in their gatherings they shall be dealt with with compassion and the promised messiah alayhi salam delivered this message to the people as it was revealed to him by allah taala but the sad thing is they didn't pay any heed and increased in their uh, rebellious and defiant behavior and then the promised messiah alayhi salam goes on to say that فَدَأَوْتُ رَبِّي بِالتَّذَرُّ وَالْبِحَالِ وَمَدَّتُ إلَيْهِ أَيْدِيَ الصَّوَالِ فَأَلْحَمَنِي رَبِّي وَقَالَ سُؤْرِيهِمْ آيَةً مِنْ أَنْفُسِهِمْ and this is recorded in the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم's book كرامات الصادقين the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم says with total humility and meekness I bowed before God Almighty and pleaded before Him thereafter He revealed to me that soon I will reveal a sign in their family. So for Alhamani Rabbi that Allah Taala reveal a sign to me. Waqala so urihim and he said so urihim ayam in anfusim that I will show a sign from their own family. And now the naturally the question arises is that how did this prophecy come about? And so you have in one abusive language towards the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and denouncing the existence of God. What happens now is, and they implore a sign from the Promised Messiah, alayhi salam. So Allah Taala, uh, the Promised Messiah, alayhi salam, now bows before Allah Taala and says, "Show me a sign." So Allah Taala then provides a scheme. What happens is that one of the sisters of Emma Bey, so the person who's been inflicted with this prophecy or soon to be, he was married to Ghulam Hussain, and Ghulam Hussain was the cousin of the Promised Messiah, alayhi salam. Now, Ghulam Hussain had been away for 25 years, and nobody knew where he was. And then this naturally meant that the Promised Messiah, alayhi salam, his family had a right to his property and land. So a request had been put forward to the government that this property should be given to his second sister. And in this moment of time, this request, when this request was being processed in the district of Gurdaspur, the sister of Ahmed Beg. came to the promised society alayhi salam and she came to know that this prophecy this property was worth 4000 or 5000 rupees and the sister of Ahmed Beg so the one who had married Ghulam Hussain she wanted this uh oh no, no, sorry Ahmed Beg wanted this property to be given to his son Muhammad Beg so 
this certificate was generated, it went to the uh, district of Gurdaspur and started being pro pro processed. But this gift certificate, which Ahmed Beg wanted to give to his son, Muhammad Beg, was futile without the approval of the Promised Messiah. So Ahmed Beg then wrote to the Promised Messiah, and it says, this is from Ayna Kamal at Islam, which you can see on your screens. The Promised Messiah said that Ahmed Beg wrote to the Promised Messiah with total humility and meekness, uh, trying to convince that the Promised Messiah signs this certificate and gives this um, uh, this deed over to uh, Ahmed Beg, so it could be given to his son Muhammad Beg. And the Prophet Sallallahu writes that, and you can see in his scheme, he says, "I was I was quite close to signing the paper, but I was adduced to the fact that whenever I take on a strenuous task, I always consult God Almighty through istikhara." And this was the response the Prophet Sallallahu says that he also gave to the addressee. And upon the persistency of the adversity, so in the persistency of Ahmed Bayt, the Promised Messiah Islam didn't go himself and said, okay, I'm going to show you a sign and you have to do this, this and this. Allah Ta'ala generated a scheme where Ahmed Bayt himself had to come to the Promised Messiah Islam. And he requested um, uh, the Promised Messiah Islam to give the deed over to him, the, the property, the land over to him. But Allah Ta'ala, uh, the Promised Messiah Islam said that, let me perform the istikhara prayer. And once I perform this Sakhara prayer, and once I uh, am told by Allah Ta'ala what he wants to, uh, what, what he wants uh, me to do, then I'll tell you. The Promised Messiah in Islam writes, what was this Sakhara? The time to implore heavenly signs had now arrived by the request of Ahmed Bayr. And this was expre expressed in the following way, following way of Allah the Almighty, which has been mentioned before. And Allah the Almighty, then therefore spoke and from these extracts so Allah, Allah said to in that istikhara prayer Allah the Almighty said that say to Ahmed Bayr that God has commanded me as in the promised Messiah that I should give you the land which you have asked for as well as some other land and that I render favors on you on the condition though now that the, the, the condition that is mentioned, Allah Ta'ala said, give him that land, give him that land and whatever he asks for, but be even more benevolent, he give even more. But the condition was that you give me the hand of your elder daughter in marriage. And so if you accept this condition, that I will also fulfill my promise towards you. But if you don't, then remember, God has told me that giving this girl's hand in marriage to some, someone else would not be blessed at all, neither for your daughter nor for you. And the Prophet Muhammad Islam, now, now the, the wordings of the prophecy come into action. He says that if you do, if you give your daughter, if you give Muhammad the Begum to anyone else, then approximately after three years of the nikah, the father, meaning Ahmed Beg, and approximately after two and a half years, her husband would die. And this is God Almighty's verdict, which is destined to happen. Now, from these extracts, it's... it's I'll, I'll, and there's a question which would naturally arise is from this: is that um, why, why, why this wh one a person's coming to ask for land? Why do you give the response that okay, I'll give you the land, but give me your daughter's hand in marriage? Why did this happen? I'll answer this uh, in in the end, towards the end of the presentation as well. But just to briefly understand, like the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam married Hazrat Safiya uh, radiyallahu taala anha to propagate the message of Islam into Jews and to get Islam propagated into Judaism so, or, or, or Jews, the same way the Prophet Messiah Islam married or was going to marry one of her relatives so that the message of Islam could be shown to them and through the practical implications of the, from the practical um, say behavior of Muhammad Begum, her family could have seen that God exists, the Holy Quran is truthful, the, Prom the Holy Prophet وسلم, is truthful. And from these extracts, it's obvious that this revelation, the purpose of this revelation was nothing more than to show God's power, God's grandeur to the family of Ahmed Bayr, who constantly rejected the existence and sign of Allah the Almighty. And this revelation was made to prove that Allah does in fact exist, to show that through his all-knowing attributes, Allah the Almighty reveals himself to, have, to whomsoever he pleases out of his beloved ones. Another purpose of this revelation was to show 
and make obvious the truth of the Promised Messiah in front of the family of Ahmed Bey. It was through this family matter that God Almighty left Ahmed Bey with no choice but to turn, turn towards the Promised Messiah and to accept him. The Promised Messiah performed the Istikhara prayer. And it was through such a revelation that God Almighty showed the family the signs that they had been waiting for since a very long time. This revelation was not a result of any personal desires of the Promised Messiah Islam, nor did the Promised Messiah Islam have any desire whatsoever for this marriage. In fact, this event was purely Allah, the Almighty's way of showing signs. And the Promised Messiah Islam's response to this was that he said, and I've mentioned this before as well, he, he wrote to the first Khalifa, um, uh, Maulvi Nuruddin at that time, anhu. And he further went on to say that I was not in need of this relationship, nor am I in any sort of dis distress, because Allah the Almighty Himself looks after the righteous and truthful. Hence, Allah Ta'ala clarified this matter that this communion was not because I was desperate for it. This is the words of the Prophet Messiah. Islam. And he went on to say that there was only one purpose behind this revelation, and that was to show the family members of Ahmed Bey who are disobedient, non-religious, and sinf sinful, the omnipot uh, omnipotence of Allah. And this was due to their constant in uh, insisting. It was they who asked for the sign, and it was they who were shown the sign. If And the Prophet of Islam went on to write that if they were to accept this uh, marriage proposal, which would have been blessed for them, then their, their, uh, the wives of the... Um, uh, then, Muhammad Begum, if she accepted the relationship proposal, then they would have been blessed like the wives of the Holy Prophet. For example, Hazrat Memuna bint Haris, Hazrat Umm Habiba bint Sufyan, Abu Sufyan, Hazrat Safiya bint Huyay bin Akhtab, Hazrat Javeri, Hazrat Soda bint Zama. And the Prophet Islam goes on to say that their ranks which would have been bestowed upon them, this rank which would have been bestowed upon them, would be similar to the wives of the Holy Prophet after they had married him. Their tribes and families entered Islam and became recipients of the great blessings because of their marriage. But if they were to reject the proposal, then Allah would reveal his torment because he works for the reformation of his creatures, be it through kindness or severity, or through blessings or tormenting. But nevertheless, Ahmed Beg was given the chance to, check, to choose his particular way. And there's an allegation which is often raised. These people say or alleges say that if Allah Ta'ala said to the Promised Messiah that your nikah will be read in heaven, why did the Promised Messiah write to uh, Ahmed Bey constantly and wrote letters after letters it's, uh, requesting a uh, Muhammad Begum's hand in marriage? But such people do not understand the way Allah Ta'ala works. Now, I was asked this question um, a couple of days ago, so I thought it's imperative and important to include this allegation and the answer to this allegation, which answers many other allegations as well, with different prophecies in this particular presentation as well. So the allegation is, why did the Promised Messiah write numerous letters to Ahmed Bey when Allah Ta'ala said that I, your nikah will be performed or has been performed, or Muhammad Begum will come into your nikah? When Allah Ta'ala had said something, why did the Promised Messiah Islam practically uh, go out and do something? But those opposers fail to understand that in Surah Majadila, verse 22, Allah Ta'ala says, Allahu la banna ana He says that surely I and my messengers will prevail. Then why do prophets come to the world? And why don't they just sit idly? Why do they make an effort and attempt to do something to, for the reformation of mankind? If Allah Ta'ala in this verse is saying that, his messengers and he himself will prevail over all other people. Messengers and prophets don't need to do anything when they come to the world. Another example is Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, Wallahu yasimuka minan nas, which clearly means that Allah the Almighty is promising that he will save the Holy Prophet. So this verse was revealed that a promise was uh, Holy Prophet, where Allah Ta'ala is directly addressing him and saying that I will safeguard you from people, from the mischief of people. And uh, those who have written Tafasir all unanimously agree that this verse 
was revealed to the Holy Prophet وسلم, in Mecca. So before he went to Medina and, and all the wars happened and the verse of Surah Hajj, verse 40, uh, was revealed to the Holy Prophet They all unanimously uh, uh, believe and agree that this verse was revealed to the Holy Prophet during his time in Mecca. But why is it that when the Holy Prophet went to war, he wore armor. He wore, at times, wore two shields of armor. If Allah Ta'ala's promise was that he would safeguard him from the mischief and harmful effects of his opponents, why did the Holy Prophet ﷺ not just sit at home? Or even if he did go to the battlefield, why did he have any sword or armor on him? It goes on to show that when Allah Ta'ala does reveal something, his words have a sense of, they should be understood and have a sense of understanding behind it. You can't just at face value say that, oh, Allah Ta'ala has promised this, therefore I won't do anything. That's misunderstanding and having a false uh, touch to what Wakil Allah means. Another example is Allah Ta'ala says in the Holy Quran that that there is no creature on this world but Allah Ta'ala is uh, in charge or is looking after its provision. So Allah Ta'ala is saying that there is no creature on this world but Allah Ta'ala looks after its provision. So why do, why do birds go out in the morning try to find finding their food and come back at night? If Allah Ta'ala said that every single animal, I will uh, feed them, b birds should have just sat idly in their nests and shouldn't have wondered or worried about anything. But you see that birds go out every morning and come back every evening. There's another verse Allah Ta'ala says that Allah Ta'ala says that And he goes on to say that Allah Ta'ala has sent his prophet with hidayat and with Dine Haq, the right faith, the true faith. So that that he may become triumphant over all other religions. And he goes on to say, Allah Ta'ala will fulfill his light. Regardless of the fact that, despite the fact that the kuffar dislike it, despise it. And there's another verse which Allah Ta'ala says that inna nahnu nazalna zikra. Allah Ta'ala is saying that we have sent down this great exaltation, this holy Quran, and we will be its guardian. Then why do we see that numerous of us are, uh, are um, born every year and the holy Quran is written day after day, week after week, month after month, and year after year? If Allah Ta'ala has had promised that he himself would be its guardian, we shouldn't have produced Qurans or Hufas in that, in that sense or in that way. Which goes on to show that when Allah Ta'ala, for example, coming back to the case of Muhammad Begum, when Allah Ta'ala wrote no, or told the Promised Messiah that this prophecy will happen, when the Promised Messiah wrote to Ahmad Bayh, he did it under or understanding these Quranic verses, where if Allah Ta'ala tells that he is going to do something, they don't just sit there, prophets don't sit there idly, but they make a practical effort in fulfilling the prophecy. And that is the true understanding, the true reliance of God, and the true tawakkal uh, Allah in His true sense. And using the means provided, it's not a sin. Writing letters, the Prophet Muhammad writing letters to Ahmed Bayh was not a sin. It didn't go against uh, misunderstanding or understanding the way Allah Taala works, because the Prophet Muhammad clears this matter in Kashtiya Nu in Noah's Ark in, on page twenty. It says that the, uh, the Prophet Islam said that I don't believe that you are going to be able to do it from the right of 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 the I don't forbid you to employ any material means without moder within moderation. Only that you don't become slaves to them like other nations have. So what uh, uh, the Prophet Muhammad uh, is telling us in Kashti Anu is that when Allah Ta'ala reveals the revelation, when he tells us something, it's not a sin to use the, uh, the, the means that are provided. And the thing is, 
what we need to focus on, as opposed to the allegations, is that did this prophecy come true? Was there an influence of this prophecy? And what happened was that when the Prophet ﷺ made this revelation, or, or, or not made this revelation, when he was given this revelation by Allah Ta'ala, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned this to Ahmed Beg. And the, Ahmed Beg did not get his daughter, Muhammad Begum, married to anyone. And the influence of this prophecy was that he didn't marry his daughter to anyone for a long period of five years. And after a period of um, a long five, five years, he, he finally married his daughter to Mirza Sultan Muhammad of Piti on the 7th of April in 1892. And naturally what happened was that because um, it was the, the revelation said that if Ahmed Beg married his daughter to anyone other than the promised Messiah, salam, his he would die within three years and his son-in-law within two and a half years. What happened was that naturally his his father died. Uh, sorry, Ahmed Beg died. And Allah the Almighty informed the Prophet Islam about Ms. Ahmed Beg's death and said that if he declines the request, if Ahmed Beg declines the request of this nikah, then the consequences of this girl will be devastating. And afterwards, whoever marries this girl will die within the time period of two and a half years of their nikah. And similarly, the father will die within three years of the nikah. And their family would suffer from privation, household crisis and dissension. And during his life, his daughter will go through tragic events and a troubled life. And according to this prophecy, Mirza Ahmed Beg was destined to live a tragic life and die within three years from 7th April 1892. The question now arose, which was that, did Ahmed Beg die within uh, three years after facing traumatized difficulties mentioned uh, in this prophecy or not? And the events that unfolded after his daughter, or daughter's nikah, which took place on 7th April 1892, uh, they all were a fulfillment or proof of a fulfillment of this grand prophecy made by Allah Ta'ala because the prophecy reflected a tragic life for him and it happened. He had to bear the loss of his son and uh, two sisters. And he suffered critical illnesses. Ahmed Beg suffered critical illnesses and he faced various or several um, failures and went through financial crisis. And after the nikah, Ahmed Beg died suffering from paratyphoid fever within five months and 24 days on uh, the 30th September 1892 in a, in a medical uh, health clinic based in Hoshiarpur. His death fulfilled the prophecy and remarkably, and remarkably proved uh, the truthfulness of the promise of Sayyid Islam. And not only this, Ms. Ahmed Beg's demise came uh, into being within three years. Uh, it didn't only come, uh, come into existence within three years, but it came at such an early stage of the three-year three time period. He died within five months and 24 days. And it significantly proved the truthfulness of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Mirza Sultan Muhammad, who was the son-in-law of Ahmed Beg, the, the husband of Muhammad Beg, he said that, and this is published in Al Fazl, he said that Mirza Ahmed Beg, so my father, his father-in-law, died in accordance with this prophecy. And in Al Fazl on the 9th to the 13th of June, uh, 1921, and this is also copied in Sirat al Mehdi, in uh, Volume One, page 190, he writes that my uh, father-in-law died as a direct result of the Promised Messiah Islam's prophecy. And one thing to note here, though, um, I know there's about uh, 15 minutes left of the lecture, and I want to give time for Q, uh, questions as well. One thing to note is that the actual reason of Ahmed Beg's death is not the rejection of this proposal, but it was the infidelity and deceitfulness that was deep-rooted in his and his relatives' blood for a long time. And because of the way they used to talk to or ask the Prophet Messiah for divinely sign, and Allah Ta'ala showed that divinely sign, it was obvious that he would earn Allah Ta'ala's wrath, his rage, 
when he was shown Allah Ta'ala's divinely sign, but he rejected it. And the family's atheism, the family's infidelity, the family's demand for a heavenly sign from the promised Messiah alayhi salatu wasalam, was the actual cause of his death. But what was the result of the prophecy? The result was you had members directly of Ahmad Baig's family who accepted um, the promised Messiah alayhi salatu wasalam. They were their family members uh, from the direct family, so blood related members of Ahmad Baig who accepted Ahmad Baig because of this prophecy. Now, it's fair enough for you and I to disagree that this prophecy didn't happen or it didn't come true. But direct family members of the of Ahmad Baig accepted Ahmad Baig on the basis that they were shown a sign. Allah Ta'ala fulfilled that sign and Ahmad Baig died because of that sign, thus so showing the truthfulness of the promise for Sayyid The widow of Mirza Ahmad Baig, the mother of Muhammad Begum, whose name is whose name was Umar Bibi and who lived in Qadian, said that she saw the mighty signs of God Almighty herself and accepted Ahmadiyyat. Not only did she accept Ahmadiyyat, but she also turned into Musia. Sardar Begum Sahib, the daughter of Mirza Ahmad Beg, accepted Ahmadiyyat. Mirza Muhammad Asan Beg Sahib, son-in-law of Ahmad Beg, accepted um, Ahmadiyyat. And Ayat Begum Sahib, the daughter of Ahmad Beg, accepted Ahmadiyyat because of this prophecy. You have Mirza Muhammad Beg, son of Ahmad Beg, who accepted Ahmadiyyat. You have Mirza Mahmud Beg, who is the grandson of Ahmad Beg, who accepted Ahmadiyyat. You have Tai Saib, who is the wife of the elder brother of the Promised Messiah Islam, Mirza Ghulam Qadir Saib, and she buried in Bajdi Maqbara, who accepted Ahmadiyyat. You have Mirza Ziyal Beg Sahib, son-in-law of Mirza Sultan Sahib and his family. They announced their entry into Ahmadiyyat on the 23rd of January 1934, and it's recorded in Al Fazl as well. You have Izzat Begum Sahib, who was the wife of Mirza Fazl Ahmad Sahib, who was the son of the Promised Messiah, who was the niece of Mirza Ahmad Beg. Their entry is recorded in Al Fazl on 7th January 1934. And if you see Mirza Sultan Muhammad, the, the son in law of um, Ahmad Beg, in regards to him, it, it's, it's the sheer grace and, and, uh, of Allah Ta'ala. But the purpose of this prophecy was fulfilled in detail, and those Quranic verities, which were uh, due to a time to, to, due to a time lapse, disappeared from the sight of people. Once again, came in front of them. The inis, uh, incident of Yunus alayhi salam certainly happened, but a long time had elapsed, and people thought that the signs relating to a good news um, always complete in their physical form. They had forgotten that the fact that the very purpose that a prophet's arrival has ever been, uh, uh, it's, it's never been to slay any particular person or nation. Rather, the very purpose which they are sent is to rectify the hearts and, and chasten the conscience self of people. And the same method is used, utilized when Inzari prophecies are made. Regardless of the fact whether any conditions are mentioned or not, if a person or if a nation whose death is notified, is mentioned, it's, it's cascaded it, it, uh, throughout. If they lower their heads to Allah the Almighty with humility and refraction and call down the hellfire by crying for forgiveness, which is ready to flutter and burn, and Allah Ta'ala is ready to forgive, then Allah Ta'ala, that merciful and compassionate entity whose blessings and mercy dominate his anger, whose forgiveness um, over powers his revenge and whose meekness is more than his anger causes a delay in the occurrence of that anxiety prophecy which uh, or he completely abolishes it and the question is that why did Mr. Sultan Muhammad die because the prophecy said that Ahmed Bey would die within three years and his son-in-law would die within two and a half years so why didn't Mr. Sultan Muhammad die and there's a hadith of the Holy Prophet where he says, "Aksaru min al-du'ai, fa inna du'a yom al-qadai al-mubram." That even those um, revelations that are uh, said that they will a hundred percent happen, like in the case of Azad Yunus alayhi salam, when the nation or when people understand the wrath of God is about to befall them, when they seek forgiveness, that calamity is taken away from them. 
so naturally and um, straight away, every single prophecy that's happened in the world, if um, those few people fall before God and seek forgiveness, then that calamity automatically goes away. So Allah Ta'ala uh, reverts that calamity which is, uh, which is about to befall them. And one a final thing I'd like to say, or say that the final message of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam regarding this prophecy was that, or before his demise, 40 days prior to his demise, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam clearly stated that the wedding part of this prophecy had been annulled. The reason why it'd been annulled was that the whole reason why this prophecy had come into being was that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's family had mired into atheism. They had estranged away from the message of, uh, or, or understanding the existence of Allah Ta'ala, understanding the purpose of why the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to the world. And when they had understood that, when they had sought forgiveness, when they came back to the right path, then naturally the prophecy would be annulled. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wrote in Badr that what happened was that an opponent from within the community had pointed towards this prophecy and said that Ahmed Baez had stated um, that this uh, this, uh, this prophecy about Ahmed Baez hadn't come into fulfillment. And the Prophet Society of Islam said that this person seems like an almost disbeliever amongst us. And he goes, the Prophet Society of Islam says that after seeing such bright, truthful signs, misguidance is still rampant upon him. He says that it is the mere fault of his eyes. And if he has such doubts which are arising in his mind, then he might not even stay a firm believer of the Holy Prophet And the Prophet Wasallam goes that the incident of Hudaybiyah is present before us. And he asks this opposer, he says, what is his view on Hudaybiyah? Then regarding Abu Jahal, it was shown that he uh, had received a bench, b bunch of grapes from heaven, but he never came to accept Islam. Prophet Jesus salam, was promised 12 of his companions. Oh, he promised 12 of his companions, 12 thrones, but not but one of them cons, uh, conspired against him, resulting in the promise uh, in Hazrat Isa salam's death, or uh, sorry, arrest. And others sent curses upon him and left him in a time of dire need. Allah the Almighty had promised the promise, the promise uh, Hazrat Musa salam, that he will be the owner of a promised land. But many years passed and nothing was given to him. Nothing happened. The promised land was given to his followers after his demise. And mentioning such doubts that can be applied to all prophets of God is basically denying Allah the Almighty's system, uh, which he pl uh, places in prophets or prophethoods entirely. Encouraging such doubts eventually lead to disbelief. And the Prophet Islam said that the incident which occurred to the people of Yunus al -Islam, is in front of everyone. It was not mentioned by Allah that asking for forgiveness will defer the punishment. The words which were used were only tubi tubi for innal balaa ala akibka. But the punishment was still averted. The same was the case here as well. The fear of Ahmed Beg's death overcame the family of Ahmed Beg, which resulted um, him in nullifying one, uh, it, uh, it resulted in Allah Ta'ala nullifying one part of the prophecy or finishing that part of the prophecy. And the truth is that Allah the Almighty sometimes shows a thousand signs, but at the same time keeps some hidden so that the disbelievers can be distinguished from the believers. And it's the same reason why this prophecy of of Ahmed Beg, of Muhammad the Begum was made. They themselves implored for a sign and they were shown a sign at the request of their own um, uh, bequest. And this prophecy did come into fulfillment. Ahmed Beg did die because of the prophecy and Muhammad the Begum and the, the rest of the family repented and turned towards Allah Ta'ala and therefore nullified that part of the prophecy that Sultan Muhammad would die and nullifying that part of the prophecy that uh, uh, Muhammad Begum will be given into nikah to the Promised Society. So that, exactly. Jazakumullah. I think it's a little bit for a very comprehensive and 
a convincing case in favor of the Prophet Muhammad in relation to the uh, prophecy regarding Muhammad Begum. Uh, I will now hand over to Shakil Rathor Sahib to conduct the Q&A session. Jazakumullah. Um, Assalamu alaikum, um, Rabbi Sahib. Uh, so the, uh, they've got a couple of questions here. One uh, uh, is regarding which books can we read on this topic for further, uh, for further reading, please. And the other question is, um, is that the what is the motivation of the critics of the promised messiah why do they propagate myths around the reality uh, of so this? the the books that can be read um, are for example i think uh, uh, um, uh, Taskara, uh, uh, Taskara should be read Taskara has all the prophecies of the promised messiah Islam written in one book and it's in english as well and so study the prophecy first from Taskara. And then, for example, read um, Aina Kamalat Islam has a lot of information about this. Um, so I would say read Taskara first and then Aina Kamalat Islam as well, definitely for more information about this topic. And um, we only yeah, so, got uh, yeah, about uh, four minutes. The, I, so uh, the second question, <laughs> yeah, the second question was, it uh, was the what is the motivation of the critics of the promised Messiah? Why do they propagate myths around the reality so, of um, this? The, the thing is, I, I mentioned in the beginning that whenever a prophet comes to the world, the Quran says that they are called liars, they're called magicians, they're called um, majnoon, for example, someone who's lost the plot knows Billah. So with every prophet will come opposition. And opposition some, is always or, uh, good in the sense that you need opposition to show the truthfulness of yourself. When you have people opposing you, then you can show the values you stand on. Oh, the the the, the ta'id of Allah Ta'ala, the help, the might of Allah Ta'ala, which is behind you. Um, and so, yeah, with every prophet, with every religious person, which every, with every noble person comes opposition. And same was the case uh, during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right. Right. Um, Okay, uh, what Jazakallah uh, Murabisa, because uh, time is uh, limited here. So I'd just like to thank you for your such an informative lecture, along with your visual presentation. It's been uh, fantastic. And a lot of viewers have uh, uh, made very good comments, uh, mashallah. So, as ever, we would like to thank our viewers for tuning in. Uh, the Talim lectures uh, return next Monday, 31st of August, when we will have a lecture by. Uh, Muhammad um, Mahmoud Khan Sahib, a Qaeda Mumin Majlis in Sarala, UK, will be speaking on the topic Shahudai Ahmadiyat. That lecture will be in Urdu. And then we have a week today, it, on Tuesday, uh, we will have the second of the three lectures of by National Secretary Tabli, Muhammad Ibrahim Iklaf Sahib, on the commentary of the Surah Fatiha. Um, so please make sure that you join us for that, for the both lectures at the same time at 7 p.m. Now I'd like to request uh, Murabi Saab uh, to um, lead us in the silent prayer. Amen. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.